Hey, everybody. Before we get started, I want to do a huge thank you to our top tier YouTube members. Currently, the YouTube stuff is turned off, uh, having some issues collecting some of the uh, funds that were earned on the channel. Hopefully, we are able to recover those. But before we do, I just want to say a quick thank you for the people who still did pay. World Champ Level A, Triple Crown, Palmer Chisel, Grand Slam Champ, Freak Maniac, 90210, and Raz. Uh, currently, the Super Chats and donations on YouTube and are turned off, as well as joining memberships. But we do have Patreon. We do have... Uh, you know, are, are different ways you can tip and donate via PayPal, Cash App and stuff in the links below in the link tree, as well as merchandise. We have all of our main logos like the Tornado Tag, ABJ Podcast, Five Questions, but we have these four logos that will be available until the 13th. We have the Fresh Prince, the WCW, the Dynasty, and the ABJ 420. So if you want to support us, head over there. Also, check out the Ben Frank Connection merchandise. They have a lot of cool stuff over there. Brand new fanny packs with some that look like title belts. You can get your favorite uh, ben, Fr ben Frank Connection uh, show on that, as well as these cool club shows. Shirts. All right, without further ado, let's get into the ABJ pro po podcast tornado tag episode 135 the history of Paul Heyman with BP Burke, baby. Let's get it. This is a Ben Frank connection presentation. What is going on? We are live. ABJ presents Tornado Tag 135. The history of Paul Heyman, myself, ABJ, and BP Burke on the call tonight doing the history of Paul Heyman. How you been, man? It's been a while. We haven't we haven't done one of these in a minute. Yeah, yeah, since before Mania. So that, that, that was an adventure. Mania was an adventure. We ran into each other a few times there. Uh, yeah. Keeping busy, keeping busy with some wrestling stuff. But yeah, always good to be back on here, back on... Uh, like we can't really call it the mothership because that's somebody else's gimmick, but yeah, the the flagship, the flagship, the the original, the OG. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, well, let's kind of dive into that. How, what was your mania like? How did you, how, how was your weekend? Your I week? had a great time. I was down there from Thursday to Monday morning. I uh, went down there with the intention of maybe if the price dropped enough, I'm going to go to night two. Why don't I go on the both nights of Mania? Uh, hung out on South Street with you for a little bit. Hung out at Attic Brewing with you for a little bit for Big Dan's birthday party. I wound up at Ring of Honor. I wound up at the Cluster Fuck. I wound up at a bunt. I Chris probably way too soon on the YouTube video. Um, but I wound up at the Cluster. You know what? Uh, yeah. Just a fun time all around. We're not monetized anymore. You're good. Curse sat away. through an earthquake. Um, <laughs> all fun stuff. All fun stuff. So it's funny. You were at we were at uh, Attic Brewing, and you had you were drinking. You were having a good time, and I remember you just look at your phone. You're like, "Here's the here's the prize for two nights." And I, he's like, "I might only just do night two. And then another beer goes down, and then another beer goes down. You're like, "Guess who's going to Mania Vault?" <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I'm proud that I'm honestly, man. Like you work really, really hard. Not just in life, and like you work really hard at your job. You work really hard in, in in content. You work really like you're just a hard working dude, man. And honestly, like sometimes I get a little bitter when it comes to wrestling, and you keep me very grounded just for your love of the art and the, the idea of what pro wrestling is. And also, you're just your love for Philadelphia and all things yeah. Philadelphia. And, and I'm 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 really happy that you pulled the trigger because it, it is hard for you to spend a buck sometimes. I'm very cheap. I'm very yeah. notoriously cheap. And the fact that you pulled the trigger and did it, like I was really happy for you. I'm glad you did that. And, and that was that was really the final determination. There it was well, okay. I was at the first WrestleMania in Philadelphia. That was 25 years ago. Who knows? It might be 25 years before it comes back. I'll be either 65 or dead by that point. Uh, so let's do it. And and it was so cool to be in my favorite place in the world, surrounded by my favorite thing in the world. So just an incredible weekend. Yeah. Well, well so like highlights, you can include anything at Mania, but what are some highlights that you uh, experienced from that week? Uh, night two of Mania is probably the most fun I've ever had at a wrestling event in my life. I was I was up in the nosebleeds, <laughs> but it was still fun. It was still fun, like just being in that building, feeling that energy, that 
that Avengers Endgame ending of of Roman and Cody was so fun. And and just before that, uh, as Bailey and EO Sky was ending, it was just little things like this. As Bailey and EO Sky are ending, I go down to use the restroom because I don't want to leave my seat during the main event. As I'm coming out, who do I who do I run into? Tom Mitchell. Out of no, nowhere, I, I just run into Tom Mitchell. Yeah, so <laughs> that's sick. Just just little things like that. Uh, Todd Mitchell, of course, from PPW, mm-hmm. um, who um, I kind of learned the interview, backstage interview game from before he went on to do bigger and better things as a wrestler. Um, just so many fun things. Like, that happened all the time. Like, at a, I was at a GCW show. I ran into Facade and Danny Moe. They were there while Facade was at, in the clusterfuck. Um, then at, I was at the Ring of Honor show, of course, ran into, surprise, surprise, Matt Turner. <laughs> And uh, yeah. I ran into Nolan Pierce and Mark Alexander. Just and it was it, it was just so fun being in the center of Philadelphia, center city Philadelphia, just walking around all these places, and you just everybody you see is in an LA Knight shirt, a CM Punk shirt, a Bloodline shirt. It's like it was truly a takeover, and it was it was so cool. It was just yeah. an amazing time. It was it was it was awesome, man. I was only ever I only got to go to three events. I was at, but I thought I think the three events I went to were definitely enough of a fill for me to yeah, say I experienced you. Mania Week. Attic Brewing, Labor of Love, knocked it out of the park. I mean, you guys can see the vlog; it's up there. Uh, definitely go check out the journals, the ABJ journals. Uh, day day one and two for Attic is all is all there with Labor of Love, and then Suplex of uh, uh, Vintage Wrestling Show was unbelievable like yes yeah, i didn't realize fun. how many people were there until i like stood up and looked down both sides of the street and couldn't see the end of people that entire block of south street was full that was an amazing time i couldn't believe it. like the the invite like that's i don't think i'll ever probably do commentary in front of that many people ever yeah, that again was, like that was that's the pinnacle you know what i mean yeah, that's um, very cool and some of the matches we got to call, like obviously being excited for Nick Wayne, Marcus Mathers, uh, Jordan Oliver, uh, Griffin McCoy, uh, um, Jimmy Lloyd, and um, uh, uh, Joey Janela. But honestly, yep. like seeing Deshaun Pratt and Mark Matt Quay in front of that many people and like so cool, them get that experience was super special to me. Like that mm-hmm. match, like. I, it was hard to put myself into like Deshaun's the heel character yeah. because they're both wrestling in front of like 3,000 people in the middle of the street mania weekend. And I love both of those guys so goddamn much. Like it's wild times, wild times. Yeah, time. so much fun. I love that show so much. Huge thank you to, to Labor of Love for letting me record there as well as Suplex Main Suplex Vintage Wrestling for having me. Um, that was awesome. I, 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 I wouldn't trade that experience in for the world. Um, yeah, so what do we got going on coming up? Uh, well, uh, I, I, just news-wise, speaking of WrestleMania, this is more na- big, big nationwide news. But uh, it was officially announced today, April nineteenth and twentieth next year, WrestleMania in Las Vegas. I'm going. I, I'm. I'm. St- I'm, I'm putting prob- my claim. I'm probably going to be paying off this year's WrestleMania by then. So I, I'm very much a, a maybe leaning no, uh, just because it's going to be maybe a little outside of my price range. But yeah, who, who knows? Who knows? Anything could happen. I said that about. <laughs> I'll take you to Pilgrim. I'll get you tuned up. <laughs> yeah, and you'll be buying tickets. <laughs> I'll, I'll be mortgaging my house to buy tickets to WrestleMania 41. But it, it should be a fun time. It's interesting though. Like I didn't even realize that's Easter Sunday. WrestleMania Night Two is going to be on Easter Sunday. I'm dressing as Jesus. There you go. Yeah, it's cold. I'm going to be wrestling In Jesus. Sin City. In, In Sin, Sin City. City. Uh, but more so um, locally. Yo, and, don't uh, tell me. I might walk around and drink beers. As Jesus. In He's Vegas, so- nobody will bat an eye. Nobody yeah. will bat an eye in Vegas. <laughs> nobody will give a damn. Do what you want to do. Oh, oh, Jesus. Oh, another Jesus. Oh, another Jesus. Yeah, I, I'm, um, I'm, I'm definitely. Doing. And it also will be 420. Yeah, yeah, I will yeah. be. I will be. I will be tuned up for Mania Week. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so as, as far as like stuff that is more local, more personal, um, coming up this coming Sunday, a week from tonight, I will be um, at Slatington Expo Center as I usually am on a Saturday, but it'll be a, a, a Sunday afternoon, uh, yeah. Sunday afternoon matinee show, three o'clock PPW Thunder Road. Uh, the Mecca Brian Johnson returns to the ring. Hasn't been in the hasn't been in a PPW match in 2024. Uh, wow. was put out of action by Clutch Adams. He'll be back to be in action against Clutch Adams. Uh, we announced a big show. What I think is going to be the show stealer, Diego Hill and GKM is going to be a big one. Uh, you talked about Griffin McCoy earlier. Griffin McCoy and the new 
PPW Women's Champion Sammy Chaos against Facade and Danny Moe in a mixed tag. It's going to be a fun show. It's yeah, Sammy, be really I think Sammy show. that week recently just like snagged three titles in one weekend and put Danny Mo through a door. Yeah, put Sammy, Danny Mo through a door. I love Danny Mo, yeah, but I'm a, I'm a Sammy Chaos fan. Sammy I, Chaos is something. Sammy yeah, Chaos she's something. awesome. <laughs> and then uh, good the, luck PPW Women's Division. Like good luck. <laughs> it, it's gonna be a it's gonna be tough to see who can stop her. And yeah, uh, but th- but that was so, that was such a great thing and with a very few exceptions. Um. That Super Show 2 in, in April, we haven't done a show since then, was it was something that me- it was a show that meant a lot to me because I put a lot into it, uh, especially behind the scenes. And with a few exceptions, everything went off as good as can be expected. So I was so happy with that. But um, you know who would be an interesting one to come back and, and challenge Sammy? Christina that? Marie. Christina Marie, maybe. Yeah, that would be a good one. Uh, there's an a, interesting. Uh, there may be a, a, some blasts in the past coming up soon. I can't say a whole lot, but uh, you may be looking into the past of PPW to see if somebody uh, kind of comes back to reclaim some territory. That's all I can really interesting. say. Though. Interesting. That's all interesting. I can really say. There, uh, you know who's another guy I'd like to see come back to PPW? Paul mm-hmm. Bo, I hope you're listening. <laughs> bring, back an old, bring back an old champion. Bring back Sean Carr. Maybe, maybe, but um, yeah, who knows? There might be a little bit of something that um could be happening soon. You never know. Yeah, that'd be exciting, exciting stuff. I will also be at PPW that week. Uh, I- I'll be bringing a friend of mine from the UK, used to live in the area. Uh, he's gonna come and hang out. Uh, the Addictively Speaking podcast. James is gonna be coming with us that show. Um, gonna grab some content. Get he- go- hopefully get some five questions with ABJ with some people. Uh, time, the last, thanks. the last one went really, really well. I enjoyed doing it. So huge thank you for Paul and everyone at PPW and Sladington for letting me film there. Um, it's not just for wrestlers too. So if you want to be a part of it, hit me up. I, I'm, yeah. I'm down to talk to anybody and do five questions with. I was gonna say you could talk to, to Chris White because he's involved in the uh, beer business too. But he's a wrestler now too. Yeah. <laughs> I I think I'm gonna uh try to interview um I'm having a brain fart. Travis just a, Travis, just because you're, he you're can't gonna do five now. questions with a guy who has his jaw wired shut. That'll be interesting. <laughs> That'll be interesting. What a what a madman that guy is. He is awesome. Uh, so much respect for a guy doing a promo with his out, literally hours after surgery in his recovery bed with his jaw wired shut and he's cutting promos. Was that he man is out cold? dedicated. Was he was out that, cold? Did he get knocked um, out cold? I don't know if he went out, but he was he was in a bad way. He he was yeah, it looked bad. Yeah, um, but can't, he's not he is insisting that he's not missing any time, not skipping any beats. That is a hustler. That good is guy, a good hu- guy. Um, yeah, and then we'll be at uh we'll also be the next weekend on a Saturday, myself yep. and you will be doing some commentary for new era pro wrestling. Um, we will be getting our office on we will be at oh, the no. the steam town mall baby yes Scranton, what the electric city what's it called now the shops at steam town never been there yeah never um, been there it's gonna be awesome uh i I'm think i've right driven now. through scranton but i'm not sure i've ever been in scranton proper or at least like scranton, downtown wilkes Bear. it's all the same thing yeah. if you've been in one they just count them both as the same thing they don't like when you say that by the way so <laughs> i'm sure they don't <laughs> uh yeah so um that's that's gonna be a lot of fun so definitely go check us out at ppw as well as new era pro wrestling all this week that i think that's all the shows yeah those yeah, are I don't think there's anything else book um if you want to buy tickets links are below the links below for uh ppw as well as new era pro wrestling even if you're not in the area and you buy a ticket send me the stubs so we can let the venues know that those seats are still um you know not available but their donations through the abj podcast right. or if you can physically be there please come i think new era is gonna add a tab on their page when you buy tickets that's called the abj ticket so if you're oh, not no. physically gonna be there there i think they're adding it i could be wrong so if you do support the, the, them and go about that route uh it would be a huge help for my, not only myself and bp uh, to use the Tornado Tag podcast to sell some tickets and help some local wrestling venues. Uh, also, huge thank you to um, High Tension Wrestling. So not only are we live right now on my YouTube channel, we are also live on the High Tension YouTube channel as well. So all of, yeah, we are simulcasting. So if you're watching this there, please head over to High Tension Wrestling and give them a subscribe as well. The link is below. Um, because we are going to be like a partner podcast. All of our content that will be on this channel will also be there and help help them get their watch hours, help them get their uh, algorithm going, that they're an active channel, and we're going to be teaming up with that. Also, make sure you support the Ben Frank Connection. A lot of great content over there. Um, I believe today 
it, it might have aired. I'm I, listen. Today was not a great day for me mentally, but we're bouncing back. But uh, today they just dropped an episode with John Alba for their one year oh, anniversary. Right. Yeah. So, um, and I think there was a special call in. I've heard uh, there was. Yes. Yeah. So John Alba does a podcast with uh, a pretty broken guy, you know, yeah. and he he may have called in the episode. So definitely go check that out. And their episode fifty just dropped uh, with. Uh, um, Mr. Kennedy, I, I didn't watch when he was Mr. there, so Anderson. I don't really, I don't, I don't know. Mr. Anderson, not Kennedy. Yeah. Sorry, I, I, I don't, I, I, he wasn't when I was consuming wrestling. I, I'd never really seen anything for him. Uh, backlash happened today, just to kind of put you in perspective. I didn't get a chance to watch it yet. I heard it was a fun show. Yeah, I heard the I, crowd I was also, fantastic. I, I saw Randy Orton and Kevin Owens make their entrance, and that's all I really saw. I got the Cliff's notes of the, I guess the, the big news coming out of it was that. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Bianca Belair and Jay Cargill won the women's tag titles, but I don't know that 100%. I heard it wasn't a great showcase either. I heard Jade looked. I've heard that AJ and Cody Rhodes was very good. And of course, the the big news, news-wise, is they, the debut of Tonga Loa, the former tag team partner of Tama Tonga. Uh, the Gorillas of Destiny now. Uh, firmly G.O.D. versus line. Usos. Let's make it happen. Gods versus Usos. Cool. We need it. Stop playing Maybe. games. Book it. And that could and be. That, it could be. Uh, it's it, a lot of people think it could be that OG bloodline versus a new bloodline, which uh, they have to be very careful with that, uh, just because you don't want it to be NWO Black and White versus NWO Wolf. Oh, we're, that's where we're going. Hopefully. This is Bloodline Wolfpack right now. Like, yeah, that's that's literally what's happening. This is NWO Bloodline Wolfpack with. And here, how's this for a segue? With the reluctant advisor for the uh bloodline wolf pack one paul Heyman. I, i'm gonna be honest at first this was this this i, I when i seen the storyline i was like oh i don't know if it got me you know what i mean i'm happy tonga's there i'm happy god's thing but i honestly what's making it exciting is the fact that paul Heyman is putting over people who aren't on screen once again mm-hmm. and paul is selling this story the fact that paul is terrified of so yeah. like the way he's selling it for solo is making it all worth the wild. Um, but yeah, so Jacob Fatu joins the bad side. Maybe, bring in yeah. Lance on Hawaii on the other side. I'm all Young for that. Old. Yeah, I'm bring all for it, that. That's what we need. That's the only two members of the bloodline that I need left. Just put Jacob Fatu on one side and put Lance on Hawaii with the Usos on the other side. And if you want to add another one with the, on that team, go for it. But that's that's what we need. Uh, yeah, I'm not a fan of mixing G.O.D. as a bloodline. They're not bloodline. They're Tongan. It always annoys me. Uh, I can see that, but also like Snuka. Wasn't he like married into? he Like the honorary family. And yeah. I know that Haku was very much a, uh, especially like The Rock. The Rock, uh, I, in The Rock's first book, maybe his only book, he talks about Haku being Uncle Tonga. That's what he called him growing up, Uncle Tonga. Yeah. And literally the first pair of wrestling trunks The Rock had were gifted to him. By Haku, by Tama Tonga and Tonga Loa's father. I love Haku. God, I love oh, Haku. The King Haku. Let's put some King respect Haku. on that name. King yeah, yeah. Haku. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, King Haku. <laughs> yeah, he... Don't kill me. I like my ears. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I'm I'm pumped. Uh, the crowd was unbelievable. I I think I think WB. Here's the biggest thing, wrestling fans. Uh, step your game up. When you pay a ticket to go to a show, bro. France, France, and 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 uh, the UK for AEW. Um, Puerto Rico, mm-hmm. if you don't step your game up, they're going to book shows overseas because that crowd, from what I've seen, absolutely bonkers. Like, how do you not yeah. want to be in front of a crowd like that all the time? Yeah, no, that, that, were, that is incredible. I seen a, a, a clip on Twitter where they're doing ring intros to G- for a, a phenomenal AJ Styles and, and Cody Rhodes, and the crowd is jumping so much in their seat, the hard cam is like shaking. Yeah. It, it, like, they had that place rocking like and that's that's that scarcity thing like they haven't they don't get a lot of live shows there and france is really if france knocked it out of the park the uk always knocks it out of the park puerto rico knocked it out of the park uh but and that was one of the great things about night two of mania especially night one the crowd was a little off it was cold it was cold in that stadium mm-hmm. night one night two like that was the first time i've ever been in the building where the building literally shook the building literally shook when uh, Cody won that title. It was amazing. That's so sick, dude. Philly, Philly I, but they said they said Philly's on the list again. Like they definitely want to bring it back. They were really happy with the turnout, but they're also talking about maybe moving Mania to 
like up a little bit, like maybe to make it so it's not as cold for outdoor venues. Yeah, they they did talk. Of, well, they moved it back about two weeks for next year, April the 19th and 20th. That's late for Mania. Yeah. And it, one of the reasons they did that, too, but Vegas is in a cold weather city. So uh, mm -hmm. and I believe Legion Stadium is a dome anyway, um, but or at least a retractable dome. But they didn't want to be when running that first weekend of April, they're consistently up against the final four on night one because yeah. that's and, and the raw after mania, which is this big ratings uh, grabber, is up against the NCAA championship game. So moving it back two weeks puts it in a bit of a dead zone in sports. The only thing you're really up against is baseball. The basketball playoffs, hockey playoffs haven't really gotten going full swing yet. It might be like the NBA playing games. They might be um, might be getting a. Um, a few other things, but um, yeah, time will tell. Time will tell. We'll uh, we do. Will, you think we, we get a mania in a in a in a not on American soil after these last performances? Um, if we do, it's probably London. Money talks. Money talks. If if, if London or if London especially, if they throw enough money at WWE, it will Wembley happen. Stadium. I think you know, Mania at Wembley, and and they might do it just to say we beat AEW's record. We'll we'll, we'll get one more person in that building. <laughs> we'll give uh, them a they, ticket. They might do that. Never underestimate the power of spite. Never underestimate the that. pettiness the of AEW. Of spite of is the most powerful force in the world. Spite can move mountains, especially in wrestling. <laughs> yes, especially in pro wrestling. Yes, one hundred percent. Most of what happens in pro wrestling fueled is born by spite. Out of spite. Yes. Yeah, fueled by uh, spite. That's a new yeah. t-shirt. Um, and with Mania, with London, the other thing too is you can do it where the time difference is not significant. You can do a London Mania. Uh, I'm not 100 percent on time difference, but if you started the Mania at like two in the afternoon U.S. time, I believe that translates to like 8 p.m. GMT. I'm gonna tell you right so, now when when AEW was in london for for their show it feels like it was starting that mania week for all in in mm -hmm. in london and i think that's going to be a, a recurring trend where like all these indie promotions run the same weekend and it's it's it has that mania vibe for all yeah. in so if wwe does it man that local independent scene in london is bonkers I, that uk I, independent scene that the wwe uh, helped kill eight years yeah, ago yeah yeah it's unbelievable like it Honestly, it's it was I it was my favorite experience I've ever had. Like it was so much fun. Like how you said people walking around Philly yeah. and like, dude, you're walking around London like at a tourist spot for the Beatles, and there's a guy wearing a, 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 a MJF shirt. And you're just like, yeah. let's go, baby. <laughs> like it was and, awesome. And, yeah, and that was so cool. And and especially the places that kind of went along with it. I I, I didn't wind up uh, going there because it was packed. Like it was you know you couldn't move. But I, I was going to stop by McGillan's Old Ale House in Philly, which is the oldest continuously running tavern in, in the country. It's been open and continuously running since like the 1800s. Yeah. And it's in this, it, it, it was just so packed in there. But they had like their entire menu or they had a special menu that was all like Helena, uh, Helena Shell tacos and things like that. <laughs> so they 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 really they really jumped into it, but it was too packed. So I. I went to the barcade next door. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, let's uh, let's jump into our topic this week. You know, speaking of Philadelphia. Time, yeah. Speaking of Philadelphia, we we did. Uh, I got I got some feedback on our last episode. Someone says, "I waited twenty minutes to hear the episode, like to hear about the topic." Well, welcome yeah. to the show. That's now you're how we start 24. every. How do you like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you complained. Now you're getting an extra four minutes. You <laughs> son of a bee. You know. Um. That's what we do. We usually, you know, have a little bit of banter in the beginning, and then we we dive into the the main topic. But uh, let's get into it here. Episode one thirty five: The history of Paul Heyman, and what a history it is. What a history it is. This is a guy who he has had his 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 hand in so many things. And he is a guy, Paul Heyman, who really is kind of the last real manager. And what I mean by that is the last guy who was a manager when there were still managers, like when a manager was an important part of the equation. And even before that, he has been in professional wrestling. Paul Heyman, I believe will be 60 next year. Um, I believe he'll be 60 in 2025. He has He'll be coming up on, at that point, close to 50 years in the business. He literally got in by in like his early teens. Um, mm -hmm. And we'll, we'll get that here. And so Heyman is 
of course, from New York, um, uh, Scarsdale, um, upstate New York, Westchester County. And his father was a an attorney, a personal injury lawyer, and a WW2 veteran. His mother was actually a Holocaust survivor. Um, she was um, legitimately went through that. That was um, that was something that really was something that really shaped him. I I forget who it was with, but he really bonded with somebody over. Oh, oh, Todd Gordon, Todd Gordon, the uh, the founder and original owner of ECW. They, uh, I don't know if Todd Gordon's family was. I don't know if he had any like immediate family like that that was also a victim of the Holocaust, but they they bonded um, very very strongly over that. And yeah, Heyman wound up getting talking his way backstage in Madison Square Garden with Vince McMahon Sr. when he was 13 years old, taking pictures. I believe he took pictures from the crowd and then like showed them somehow wormed his way backstage. One of the th things you're going to learn about Paul Heyman is he has the gift of gab. He is somebody that can, he has that silver tongue. He can work his way in any situation. He can, if he was a fallout character, uh, if, I know fallout's like a big thing now because of that, the TV series, charisma, charisma 10. beat. Yeah. Charisma plus 10 like, plus a 10 bonus. Yeah. 10. And then he, yeah. Charisma 10. Um, intelligence is probably very high as well. Yes. Um, agility, no. Uh, but when he was younger, maybe. So Heyman would, <laughs> Heyman was very into photography at first, took a lot of pictures. He would take pictures ringside. And, and this is where, and uh, Stephen Chambers in the chat kind of brought this up. This is where he, the parallels with Jim Cornette start. And for a while, those two were very intertwined early in, early in their respective careers, where Jim Cornette got started taking pictures in Memphis. He took pictures for Jerry Jarrett's promotion and Paul Heyman did the same thing for the WWWF taking pictures as a, as a young teenager. And then as he got older, he wound up getting, um, and this is very funny because of the whole wise man thing. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know if everybody knows the whole the importance and the, the meaning behind calling Paul Heyman wise man in these promos. And it comes from the three wise men. And the three wise men were the WWF had a system where pretty much every heel or at least every heel that was getting a push had a manager. It was just a way, excuse me. It was just a way that when somebody came in as a heel, because you would come in, they would build you up. You would have a program with a guy on top and you would cycle out very quickly unless you were like a life or like a killer Kowalski or somebody. Um, so when they wanted to heat somebody up, the way you could get somebody instant heat is you put them with a the heel manager. And for the longest time, those three heel managers were Freddie Blassie, Captain Lou Albano, and the Grand Wizard. And Jeez. they were the three wise men. They were called the three wise men. Mm -hmm. And two of the three wise men, as Heyman got a little older and was able to drive, uh, they lived in upstate New York. And he had a job actually driving Albano and Blassie to the Madison Square Garden show. So this is a guy who as a before his 20th birthday is getting this experience of kind of sitting at the learning tree with classy Freddie Blassie, who is uh, one of the most successful wrestlers ever and a great manager too. And Captain Lou Albano, who was probably the most over the three wise men as far as a, a Albano was essentially the top heel in WWF in the seventies or WWWF. It was just that they, they would use him to get somebody heated up for Bruno. Mm -hmm. And so there's a very legendary story that Heyman told. He uh, told this after Albano died, where uh, Lou Albano was known for, um, he had a fondness for a, a drink. He, had, he would like an adult beverage or five um, before a show. And five is probably a, a gross understatement. And there was one point where they're going to the garden. In fact, he would be so drunk, he would get in arguments with Vince Sr., quit, and then have to beg for his job back on a routine basis. Um, <laughs> So they're going to the garden and the captain is three sheets to the wind and they're in the middle of the street in New York city and Albano just starts peeing. He starts peeing in the middle of the street. And as at that point doing, in time in, in New York, it's probably, he's probably not point, the only one at that point in time, at any point in time in New York city <laughs> at any point in time. Um, so Heyman clocks these two cops come in their way. And he's like, Oh no. Oh no, the captain's getting arrested. And Blassie sees it too. And, and Blassie provides coverage of, hey, classy Freddie Blassie, Hollywood fashion plate. How are you? Like glad handing with the cops. And the cops are all talking to Blassie. And they were like, 
is that the captain? And they're pushing by, and Heyman's like, oh, no, we're dead. We're doomed. We're doomed. And they just wanted to meet Captain Lou Albano. They looked, if they saw what happened, they looked the other way, and the captain, the captain got off scot-free. So... Do you think he shook their hand? Probably. Yeah, yeah, that was probably. That was, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was, a, that was an unwashed captain. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah, that yeah. was. Yeah, you, you had the little captain stag on that thing. So, Heyman's doing that. He's doing a lot of photography. He is getting a little deeper in that. He also started writing in the '80s for a lot of wrestling magazines. There's um. Now, the Grand, yeah. is, the Grand Wizard is that is that based on? the grand wizard that we would think about or is it what what was that derived from probably not the grand wizard was actually a jewish man ernie roth the grand wizard was he originally uh, came to fame in the detroit area as abdul farouk he was the manager for the original sheik and he did really well with that and then he wound up going to the to uh the wwf and becoming the grand wizard the grand wizard would wear very loud suits he would wear a turban, sunglasses. And if you've ever heard Father James Mitchell, if you've ever heard, um, yeah, Genie Turban, like uh, like the Great Tiger from Punch Out. Yeah. And if you've ever heard Father James Mitchell do promos, the uh, the manager who was mostly in TNA, he was a sinister minister in, in ECW yes. as well. His whole, I'm not saying he ripped off the Grand Wizard, but his- Very inspired. His, his, um, his tone of voice, his way of speaking, is very, very reminiscent of the Grand Wizard who would talk like is that, that. Is that the guy who was doing drugs on TV for TNA? Yeah, the guy who did NWA, NWA or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. James yeah. Mitchell. <laughs> <laughs> so so but the Grand Wizard was a, a very influential manager and and somebody that uh, was, he, he was one of the three wise men a long time, um, yeah. very successful manager in wrestling. And Heyman uh, kind of learned of these guys, w- wrote for a, a, a slew of different wrestling magazines. Never the after mags, I don't think, but like smaller wrestling magazines. Um, I, I, think the, I think he worked for George Napolitano, who was a huge publisher in New York. Worked for smaller things as well. And he also wound up, and this is after this club, this club had its heyday in the 70s. It was kind of on the downswing at this point. He wound up working with Studio 54, the legendary Studio 54 in New York, the nightclub. And he wound up getting a wrestle party set up. He, he had also made friends with Bam Bam Bigelow. Bam Bam Bigelow at this point in 1984, 1985 was training at the Monster Factory. And as much as anybody could, because you don't really have this in pro wrestling, he was like this guy, like everybody was like, no, you got to see this Bigelow kid at the Monster Factory. He's going to be a superstar because he was a big, tough looking guy, a bald head with flames tattooed on it. Over 300 pounds and can do cartwheels. <laughs> it's like this guy and is a can't miss. Yeah, and well, I don't think anybody was doing moonsaults really back then, but he 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 seemed like he could do pretty much everything. And Ham Hammond became uh very much a, a, a huge promoter of Bigelow, and to the point where at Studio 54 he put together a huge uh event, Wrestle Party 85. He had um Bigelow's debut match. He wound up getting connected with Jim Crockett Jr., who sent Ric Flair, Dusty Rhodes, and a few other people there. They did an award for Flair, I think, like, Man of the Year, uh, Bam Bam Bigelow's debut. And Bigelow kind of stuck with Heyman and kind of got him to become his manager for a little bit. And they worked in Florida. And in Florida, that's where Paul Heyman becomes Paul E. Dangerously, which is... I will still when I when I if I think of Heyman I I, I will always kind of go Pauly instead of Paul Heyman. Pauly is going to be my my kind of go to, and that is Paul E. Dangerously is the one in the gray suit there on the right of the graphic you're showing. That would be more of the Pauly Dangerously, especially with that cell phone. Mm-hmm. That cell phone is uh, is the trademark, and I there was a Michael Keaton movie called Johnny Dangerously, and because he kind of had that look, that's where the Paul E. Dangerously thing came from, and. He had some success early. He wound up eventually getting into Memphis. Uh, Jerry Lawler infamously broke his jaw, uh, which I think he said was on purpose with a punch uh, because he didn't like him. And later on, he was in the AWA, and he managed a a variation of the Midnight Express in the AWA. Dennis Condry and Randy Rose, who were part of the original. The original Midnight Express in Memphis was Dennis Condry, Randy Rose, and Norville Austin. Well, if you remember, we talked about as being 
a tag partner of Sputnik Monroe. They were the mm-hmm. uh, black is beautiful, white is wonderful tag team. Uh, Sputnik <laughs> Monroe and, and uh, Norval Austin. But very quickly, Randy Rose kind of fell by the wayside and then Conjury and Eaton became the Midnight Express. And by the like, by 788, the Midnight Express is Stan Lane and Bobby Eaton. It's the it's that later incarnation of the Midnight Express. But Conjury and Rose are in the AWA with Paulie Dangerously as a as the original Midnight Express. And Paul E is getting a very uh, favorable comparison to Jim Cornette at this point. Cornette is kind of, he's more of like, he's like the Northern Jim Cornette. And it's a little more like uh, Cornette was like a spoiled mama's boy. Uh, he's buying all these wrestlers. That is his mother's giving the money to buy up all these wrestlers. And Paul E was more of a yuppie. He was like uh, Jim Cornette meets Gordon Gecko from Wall Street. And Wall Street was actually where, like, he had that big brick mobile phone, like those old cell phones that were fairly like large. I always got like a Wall Street or a, like a car salesman from yeah. Wally Dangerous. Yeah, just like, a slimy, slimy. Yeah, <laughs> he's gonna try read to... the fine print of the contract. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and he would use the phone as a weapon. And so after the AWA run, they the um. W or Crockett, Jim Crockett Promotions, they they decide, Dusty Rhodes decides, let's bring these guys in and we're going to do the original Midnight Express against the new Midnight Express. So they bring in, uh, with a lot of fanfare, they bring in Paul Han- uh, Paulie Dangerously, Dennis Condry, Randy Rhodes, and they turn the Midnight Express baby face. So now you have Jim Cornette's Midnight Express against Paulie Dangerously's original Midnight Express. And this is a, a fairly hot feud. Uh, this is a fairly hot feud. And in between these stints, I, I did miss something that's very important. Uh, shortly before this, uh, for for a while, Heyman was working in Memphis and also in Alabama. And that's where he meets Eddie Gilbert. And, and I don't want to say a whole lot about Eddie Gilbert because Eddie Gilbert could easily, easily, easily be a show into himself. Uh, Eddie Gilbert was uh, ahead of his time creatively, uh, and and if if he had come around twenty years later, he would have been a very successful wrestler because the only thing that was holding him back in the eighties and early nineties was his size. It was the fact that he was under six feet tall, and while he was in um, he was in very good physical condition, he wasn't a steroid monster, and that held him back a bit in the eighties. More more so his height, more mm-hmm. so his height than than anything else. But is he kind of like a backland? Um, no. Um, Eddie Gilbert is more Eddie Gilbert always wanted to be Jerry Lawler, but he was Jerry Lawler. Jerry Lawler was kind of almost exclusively a heel. And I think Ryan Vox has claimed dibs on the Eddie Gilbert episode. <laughs> it, uh, yeah. So, yeah, Eddie Gilbert is is a, a very, very famous, a very, very well renowned. And I, I don't want to say forgotten, but because he never had that big big run with the the WWF and he he did have a run with the NWA but it was more of when they he came over from the UWF the UWF he had a great run as a heel uh it was part of a very famous angle with Bill Watts and the Russians and he uh, he was booking in Alabama and brought in Heyman and they had they had a lot of um they had a lot of creative success there but right. that checks out and but but then when Heyman goes to, to the uh, the NWA, I think Gilbert is there on the same time too. That is where he really gets into this whole thing of this feud with Cornette. He Cornette has a tennis racket. Hey, uh, Paulie Dangerously has a cell phone. Very famously, very famously, uh, Paul Heyman used the cell phone on Jason Hervey, who was a famous actor at the time. He was the older brother of Fred Savage on The Wonder Years in the 1980s, and. Yeah, there it is. Heyman would do a. An we got to bring Stephen Shamans in our an episode yeah. with you. Like, yeah, Stephen, you Stephen knows his stuff. Uh, the Heyman or Paulie would have an interview segment called The Danger Zone. The Danger Zone was like his Piper's Pit. And I think he had, they, they did a Clash of the Champions or something like that where, where Jason Hervey was on the Danger Zone and he wound up smashing him over the head with the, uh, the, the phone because Jason Hervey was around a little bit because he was dating Missy Hyatt. Um, Missy Hyatt had, I think, broken up with Eddie Gilbert at that time. Eddie Gilbert was. Um, one of the many dalliances, one of the more serious dalliances that Missy Hyde had. Uh, she came into the business through another wrestler, Hollywood John Tatum, 
And then, but I think uh, uh, she had the closest relationship with Eddie Gilbert. And I she, believe she they also were brought in, she brought in Buff Bagwell, didn't she? Missy Hyatt? She dated Buff Bagwell for a little bit. Yeah. Like she's the one who um, broke him in. Like she's seen him and she's like, you should be a wrestler. Like you have a good look. Yeah. She <laughs> dated, um, she briefly dated Jim Kelly from the Buffalo Bills. Uh, she, okay. she dated Rod Brindamore from the Philadelphia Flyers hockey player. Uh, but I, yeah, I believe that uh, the Missy Hyde and Eddie Gilbert were married. She she may have also been married to John Tatum for a moment. But yes, Missy, Eddie Gilbert, Paul, Paulie Dangerously, all of these people are in uh, the NWA, Jim Crockett Promotions in 1988. And the, the Midnight Express angle kind of comes and goes. And there's an infamous tuxedo match at Great American Bash 89, which is an amazing pay-per-view. Uh, there's a tuxedo match with Jim Cornette and Paulie Dangerously that has any is better than any right it has to be, uh, because they actually have some psychology behind it. I think Cornette's hurt, but they still have a really good match. They work his knee injury into the into the match, and then after that kind of fizzles out, and uh, Dennis Condry and Randy Rose leave. Randy Rose, one of them actually left before the the ma- the blow off match was like the loser of the fall has to leave, and Jack Victory winds up being being a part of it. But then after that, for a little while, for a little while, Paulie Dangerously managed Mean Mark Callis, who would, of course, go on to become The Undertaker. But he was a singles, a singles wrestler with, um, with Paulie before he became a skyscraper. And then he kind of very, for a little bit, he winds up being phased into more of a commentary role. Commentary, interviewer, works a lot with Jim Ross, works with Gordon Soley. I think he was in and out a little bit. So he was a um, a commentator for about a year and a half, two years there. Until 1991. In 1991, um, there's a lot of turmoil in, in the NW. At this point, it's WCW. Jim Crockett has sold sold the company in late 1988. Uh, they, they kind of floated between the NW and the WCW name. But by 1991, it is firmly WCW. They don't call them the champions, not the NWA champion anymore. Uh, Jim Crockett has nothing to do with the company. Dusty Rhodes has nothing to do with the company. Actually, Dusty Rhodes is kind of on his way back, but he's he's on his way back halfway. Mm-hmm. Um, but or no, by ninety one, uh, Dusty's still in. No, Dusty came back in in ninety one. I I was a little confused on the dates here myself. Um, but by the way, BP's freestyling this whole thing. Yeah, there, yeah, there's, there's no notes yeah, here. There's, there's no, no notes. notes <laughs> I just want to. So if I'm stammering, I apologize. I want to tip the hat a little bit. BP is 100 freestyle on this. <laughs> I love this. So guy. <laughs> th- this is this is where we get into uh, where Paulie really comes into his own. And this is in 1991. Ric Flair leaves. Uh, Ric Flair is gone, and he's in the WWF. And now we need to kind of do what, whatever we can to make people forget the four horsemen, which is hard, which is hard. Arn Anderson's around, but Ric Flair has gone. Tully Blanchard's gone. Um, Ole Anderson's backstage. He was actually booking for a little bit and then Dusty came in. Um, so one of the people they're getting in because he had some disputes with Vince is ravishing Rick Rude. So at Halloween Havoc 1991, the WCW Halloween Phantom uh, it comes in and it's Rick Rude, and that slowly begins the formation of one of my personal favorites. That you're too kind. Uh, one of my personal favorites, the Dangerous Alliance. So the Dangerous Alliance is the dominant stable from 1991 into like early mid 1992 in WCW, and what a group this is. The, the Dangerous Alliance consists of Ravishing Rick Rude, who was the leader, the centerpiece, uh, the young up and comer is uh, the TV champion at the time, goes by the name of Stunning Steve Austin. And then your tag team is Arn Anderson and Bobby Eaton. And then your kind of veteran presence is Larry Zabisco. That's a stable. And not only do you have Paulie Dangerously as your manager, he has his uh, director of covert operations, Medusa. Uh, So Dangerous Alliance is thumbs up. Dangerous Alliance is an incredible stable. So Dangerous Alliance versus Bloodline. Who wins that? Who wins that matchup? It, who, whoever they booked to win. I hate that. I hate that question. I, I never like that. Whoever they booked to win it. Usos uh, versus Arn and Tully. Uh, well, it's Arn and Bobby Eaton. It's Arn, Arn and, and Bobby, Bobby Eaton. Eaton. Um, Roman versus. Do you put Roman versus? You got to put versus Rick. The, the right? figurehead would be Roman against Rick Rude. And it'd then probably, like if Solo you're doing it that Solo way, it'd be versus... Roman against Rick Rude. Yeah, Usos against Anderson and Eaton. 
solo against um, stunning Steve, stunning Steve, yeah, and and then uh, Zabisco against like Sami Zayn, I guess. Sure. <laughs> Zabisco <laughs> want to turn a baby face too. Um, <laughs> and, and, and no, you do all five and you put it in the war games because it's Ryan yeah. Box in the chat. Best war games ever. I'm always back and forth between that one and the one from 91. I am a huge Brian Pillman fan, so I have a very soft spot for the 91 war games. I'll tell um, you what, we have a war game shaping up that look it's gonna be pretty interesting this yeah, year. Maybe yeah, we, we do. Blood, yeah, we Bloodline do. Wolfpack versus Bloodline. <laughs> but 1992 is a, a huge year for the Dangerous Alliance. Uh Rick Rude is probably the uh I mean Vader is your top heel in the company at that point. Vader's kind of running through people. But Austin is, um, and he's so different than Stone Cold. He's just a cocky heel, long blonde hair, um, just it, almost a completely different wrestler. But Heyman and 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 Austin just say they they learned so much from Rick Rude. They learned so much from Rick Rude, and Rick Rude was at the top of his game here. I love Vader, but you could have made an argument that Rick Rude should have been your world champion. He was the U.S. champion for most of this run. Um, but yeah, Rick Rick Rude God, was the man. God love, God love Lily. She's still new. Yes, Austin had long flowing. <laughs> he had blonde long hair. flowing blonde hair. In fact, I I, uh, I I before I had to go do some stuff today, I was watching. I, I forget what 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 inspired me to watch this, but I watched. Uh, it's one of the worst pay per views ever. Great American Bash 1991. I watched the first match, which is a scaffold match between Steve Austin and Terrence Taylor. And um, Bobby Eaton is on the other side. Bobby Eaton's a babyface. This is pre Dangerous Alliance. And PN News, who was a like a four hundred pound big dude. And I, I, I like they they were so terrified to be on that scaffold. You could capture the flag, so you didn't have to throw anybody off the scaffold. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, it was bad. But that Austin's hair was rocking at that point. And his, uh, I believe, his second wife, uh, Lady Blossom, was was there. Uh, that was his manager at at the time, his valet. Uh, she, I believe, if I'm not crossing up my people, is the person who came up with the term Stone Cold because she mm -hmm. was British and said your tea is getting Stone Cold. But I might be confusing Austin's first and second wives there. But anyway, we're talking about Paul Heyman, not Steve Austin. So yeah. the Dangerous Alliance is a huge, huge deal, but it starts to fizzle out like anything else. Uh, there, there's stunning Steve Austin with the uh, I love the, the WCW TV title. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that hair for both those guys. Look at that hair. Yikes. And, and Steve Austin was that guy. Like, Steve Austin was the blue chip prospect. Steve Austin was like almost like an Austin theory of his time, except a lot better. Um, yeah. like Steve Austin, he he says like he he needed to come into his own. He was he was good from the start. He was really good. Uh, but they they fizzle out and Bill Watts takes over WCW and through uh, the middle of 1992. And Bill Watts fired Heyman in 1993. And the allegation that was made that he was like falsifying uh, expense reports or something, but it was never really proven. And, and Heyman sued WCW uh, for wrongful termination. And uh, he quoted ethnic discrimination. I um, Bill Watts was kind of very loose lipped, especially about like controversial topics. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if a, um, an ethnic slur may have uh, found its way out of his mouth, but when pa when Paul Pauly dangerously leaves WCW, he is kind of a man without a country. He doesn't go to Vince. He he goes to Jim Crockett Jr. We had a relationship now by 1993. He's had a relationship with Jim Crockett Jr. for eight years, going back to that Studio 54 thing. And Jim Crockett, it's been five years since he sold to Ted Turner, and he had a five year non compete in that contract for the sale of Jim Crockett Promotions, and it's over. So Jim Crockett was talking about putting something together called the World Wrestling Network. Um, and it never really got off the ground, but Paul E. Dangerously was going to be his booker. Paul E. was going to be the um, the kind of Jim Crockett's Dusty Rhodes for the World Wrestling Network. And I think all he ever really did for the WWN was one set of tapings in New York. And they never really did anything else. But at the time, uh, there's a little company in Philadelphia that's starting to gain, gain a small following, especially locally, called Eastern Championship Wrestling. Yeah, the They run Eastern. out of a... Yeah, Champion. Eastern Championship Wrestling. They run out of a little. Um, they run out of a little. Uh, they always say a bingo hall, but it was more than that. They they ran out of a. Uh, there's this thing in Philadelphia called the Mummers. The Mummers are a. Um, they do a big New Year's Day parade, and they like the suit Jason Kelsey, where the people that came out with Seth Rollins at WrestleMania, they're the Mummers, 
And there's mm -hmm. a group of the members called the South Philadelphia Vikings. And they that was their hall. That's where they stored all their props for their, their parade stuff. That is where they would do bingo to raise money. Um, you could rent out the hall if you had a wedding reception or, you know, if you were trying to raise money for somebody, they, they would do like beef and beers and stuff there. But it was Viking Hall, which would later be known as the ECW Arena. Uh, Mike Schmidt's Sports Bar was before that. <laughs> Mike Schmidt's Sports Bar was where they originally ran. Uh, they ran a lot of other places. They ran at a, a club called Pulsations, uh, which was a huge nightclub in Delaware County that um, it was had seen better days at that point. They did a TV taping at Cabrini College, which is I think uh, I think they're wrapping up now. They're 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 going defunct as a, uh, a university. But they did a, t a TV taping in Cabrini College, and almost nobody showed up because there was a gigantic blizzard that the day of the TV taping. It was like two feet of snow. But they did settle into the um, the Viking Hall as their home base, where it, it's still called the ECW Arena to that day, or to this day. So mm -hmm. um, Paul, Paul, Paul Heyman gets on the radar of ECW because Todd Gordon owns it, and his head booker, the guy who is kind of putting all his shows together, is Eddie Gilbert. <laughs> And Eddie Gilbert wants to bring in Paul Heyman basically to, to um, assist with booking and to be a manager and to help produce interviews, essentially, because Paulie has, it was known for being a great interview guy. And a, a lot of this, I'm going to, because I read Todd Gordon's book last year, a lot of this is going to be kind of his side of the story, um, his side of the story and, you know, came inside of the story as well. But basically, Paul told Todd Gordon, you know, I don't I don't want you to pay me any money, but just so you know, I'm here scouting wrestlers for Crockett. And and Gilbert and Gordon wound up becoming on the outs. There was a lot of fighting there. And unfortunately, Eddie Gilbert shortly after that wound up in Puerto Rico where he passed away later that year. Mm -hmm. He was only 33 years old. So then after uh, Eddie Gilbert was on the outs, uh, Todd Gordon made Paul Heyman the, the, the booker. Now, Gordon claims a lot of the creative stuff he was still doing, but Paul was the guy who was always facing the talent. Like, Todd's your money guy, I'm the creative guy, was essentially the division of labor there. Uh, and he was the manager. He managed Sabu, he managed 911, and they wound up having uh, a deal with the NWA. And obviously, that goes away when Shane Douglas throws the belt down. That's when they become extreme championship wrestling. And by the 90s, or by like 1995 or so, that is when Paul Heyman becomes the owner of ECW. And Todd Gordon um, is still around, uh, but but Paulie is the owner. And there's a, uh, some people say Paulie bought him out. Essentially, Todd Gordon is kind of alleged that Paulie kind of screwed him out of it, for lack of a better term. Like, uh, Todd was kind of out of money. They had made these TV deals where they were buying time on like MSG Network in New York and Sunshine Network in Florida. And they were losing so much money that eventually it was just like, just take on the debt. Just take on the debt. I'm out. And and he wasn't out like he was still an on-screen character. He, he was still doing a lot of stuff there. But it, in 1995, it becomes Paul Heyman's company. Yeah. He and and here's, here's the thing, too. You have to realize this guy has been around since he's 14. Yeah. And around Vince Sr., and then works his way on, yeah. works in that territory and probably is just soaking up as much knowledge mm -hmm. as he can. And then goes down south and deals with like dudes like Jerry Lawler breaking his jaw and like, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. going through it, you know what I mean? Because like we're only on a small independent wrestling scale. This like and, yeah. and see some stuff like this guy is just soaking it in, goes to WCW, probably thinks that's his lifer, gets, you know, taken out from there and then sees this company and sees the talent and goes. I can run this and see you know what I mean? starting to get a small cult following and he's just going to mm -hmm. throw gas on that fire. And they, and they did yeah. a great job like Heyman and Gordon, no matter what you want to say, they did a great job of turning that into ECW changed wrestling forever. Like there's no attitude error without ECW. There's yeah. there, a there's lot a, of, a lot of wrestling today. Is, I mean, during the Paul, during the hall of fame speech, he's like, if yeah. you think ACW is dead, you can, you can yeah. suck my dick. You know what I mean? Like it ain't there, dead. There's, it, I'll go so far as to say there, there's a chance that without ECW, WCW wins. Yeah. WCW wins because that ad attitude, that the attitude era was ECW's playbook on WWF's budget. That was the attitude era. That is. Do you, the, do you believe in the theory or the rumor that WWE was essentially giving ECW money to stay afloat? Not a rumor at all. Got, like, 
I, 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 well, I mean, like for a while there, people were like, it didn't happen. It did happen. But oh, it like, 100% happened. Yeah. Here, here's the way it happened. This is Heyman's version of events. If I'm jumping too far ahead, you can you can no just no no we'll you're, get you're there fine in a second, you're yeah. fine we're 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 moving in that we're moving that in that direction because yeah. ECW is growing it's getting this cult following, and and Paul Heyman very very early on opens up some back channels with Vince McMahon, and he is he Paul Heyman says that Vince never funded ECW, but he paid Paulie as a consultant and then Paulie would use that money to fund ECW so there's like a little workaround. Uh, there's a little work and, and the fact that he became so good with talent and respected by talent and seeing things that other companies weren't in talent like he just cherry picked rejects essentially that people yeah. thought weren't good enough to be on their tv and built ecw with it like, yeah, like shane douglas shane douglas is uh well sabu was just uh, he, he was really famous in japan and he was he was like he had gotten tryouts other places but nobody really wanted to deal with sabu and his style, like the mainstream wrestling wasn't mainstream wrestling, especially the WWF wasn't ready for a guy whose whole gimmick is he's suicidal, homicidal, genocidal. He goes through tables and stuff like that. Like WCW tried with Sabu in 95 and it didn't work. Uh, but there, there are some other uh, there are some other things like um, I, I believe Heyman said they were getting money from Def Jam Records to play music for Too Cold Scorpio. Like there was a music licensing thing where or that there was something with Too Cold Scorpio where yeah, I think they were getting like a thousand dollars a week for uh from Def Jam Records or something like that. But essentially, like the the their shows, like the old ECW TV shows, a lot of your commercials were for ECW. It was like ECW tickets. It was buy this ECW videotape. It was it was basically the, the uh, they were selling their own product. And as nine as as you get into the later nineties, like ninety six, ninety seven, that's when you start to see that. The Monday Night War is in full swing and WWF starts to rely on ECW more as a kind of breeding ground for people like they would they would send people down there to learn. They would send people down there to develop. It was it was like a proto developmental. They would send them to Memphis. They would send them to ECW. And it's um, it's wild that like now we watch wrestling and if Tony Khan goes on TV and says something about WWE, you're like, you don't do that. Oh no, that's terrible. How can you fun. Take shots? stop it? That if was the best part of the 90s. You can't take shots at other companies, sure just you worry can. about your own company. Paul Heyman would put storylines of Mick Foley wearing WCW shirts, yeah. and they made fun of the BWO like ECW yeah. was founded on saying F the mainstream products and, Shane, and openly saying it. <laughs> Shane Douglas would call out Ric Flair every every show. <laughs> Dick Flair, I challenge you to come here. Like, yeah, there was, and, and and Heyman was smart enough. Heyman was smart enough to know that that Vince was respected by his audience more than Eric Bischoff was. Like they didn't like WWF. WWF was cartoonish, WWF was a circus, it was for kids. This is for adults. We like this better, but they at least respected Vince. They hated Eric Bischoff. Eric Bischoff was this Ken doll, uh, smiling, empty suit that we hated. Uh, East, East versus Jakar, those are two very different styles. Those are two very <laughs> different let, styles. Real, real quick, let's entertain that. Let's book okay. a card. Let's book an ECW versus Shakara card. Well, you kind of got you 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 almost have to do Tommy Dreamer against Eddie Kingston as your main event. That, that yeah. that's got to be your main event. But yep. That that is you can star that. And then you can look at like, okay, the guys who who would you put Van Dam against? Like Van there's so many like athletic people like Fire Ant, uh, Van Dam and Fire Ant, or Van Dam and Sabu against the colony, you can do. <laughs> okay. Uh, Van Dam and Sabu <laughs> against the colony. There you go. Um the Dudley Boys against Los Ice Creams. Uh just because or, no, or Dud probably Dudley Boys, Dudley though. Boys versus um the uh uh Hollow Wicked. Ultramanus. Oh, and the spectral. Uh, the spectral. The spectral. You can do that. Yeah. You can do that. Um, um, yeah. Cla Cla Claudio versus. Um, yeah, that that's who I was kind of stuck on. Jerry Lynn is probably that, because that would be an amazing match. Yeah, Claudio against Jerry Lynn. Um, <laughs> that would be that would be your your match of the night. <sighs> yeah, there's the, so many good ones. Jazz I, against I, Sarah Del Rey. Uh, we, if you want to put a women's <laughs> yeah. match in there, Jazz against yeah. Sarah Del Rey is your, your women's match. Or, um, yeah. I'm, well, Orange I'm, Orange wasn't really a Chikara guy. He, he was Fire Ant. Fire he Ant. Was fire, he was Fire Ant under yeah, oh, Chikara. Okay, okay. Uh, oh, sorry. We don't know who the Fire Ant yeah. is. Um, I don't know who that Soldier Ant was either. Yeah. 
Yeah, that, that'd, that'd yeah, be a that'd fun be card. Fun. That, <laughs> we already booked the fantasy war games with Paul Heyman stable, uh, but ECW versus Chikara, that'd be crazy. Yeah. And as we get into like 96, 97, ECW's big push is pay-per-view. We need to get pay-per-view. We need to, like, that's the next step in in building this. Um, but, but real quick, pay-per-view. and it's funny he brought brings up Chikara is because EC, Chikara filled that void that was missing for a long time in the Philadelphia yeah. area. You know um, what I mean? Like, Not really. Not really. No? Um, you, don't, you don't think Chikara had no. that cult following that an ECW kind of had in the city of Philadelphia? It, it, it did for a second. It did for a second, but after ECW goes away, I think the re- even though it was a completely different product, but then again, so was Chikara. What popped up to fill the void of ECW was Ring of Honor. Yeah, it's a good call. That's a good Ring call. of Honor yeah. was and, well, and actually, well, Ring of Honor is the one that really was super successful. Um, they they existed before ECW, but as far as that hardcore, ultra violent thing. CZW, CZW, CZW. CZW. yeah, yeah, yeah. Because before ECW went belly up, they were mainly running out of Jersey. Um, Mm -hmm. and then when ECW kind of went away, and I mean, and GCW is essentially trying to be the modern day ECW. That was the rest for CZW. Like, yeah, that's where that's where a lot of those guys, where Nick Gage started. That's where a lot of their guys started. But, um, CZW was kind of the the theme successor as far as uh successor of of ecw uh in fact i think to this day czw has more run more events in ecw arena than in 2300 arena than any other company including ecw um, I, I see i see some old czw stuff that i've never known existed like popping up on my timeline they mm-hmm. were crazy yeah uh and and there, there were so many different <laughs> eras of that uh because we're ta- i'm talking about like 2001 um, like John Zandig, CZW, not DJ Hyde, CZW, no, no disrespect to either one of them, yeah, but, yeah. uh, just like the immediate aftermath of Nick Gage, Justice Payne, the Backseat Boys, all those people, um, that were really, um, kind of putting them on the map. And then XPW comes in and there's that big war XPW for a few months has exclusivity over the ECW arena. And now you're kind of seeing XPW up on the radar again, ring of honors coming up um three pw was one that was around for a little bit that was the uh the blue meanie and at that point he was in a uh relationship with jasmine st Clair, the adult film actress and they started a company called three pw which was more of the kind of where czw kind of what had the violence of ecw uh three pw had a little bit more of the essence of we're gonna use a lot of old ecw guys and have that ecw kind of more feel yeah so it, it it almost it's almost like when Superman died and you had the Man of Steel and you had um the cyborg Superman and you had um Superboy and you had the other Superman yeah. with the just, you can't shake a stick in the in the in the tr- in the northeast area and and not have someone who's inspired because of yeah. the ECW and Paul Heyman. Yeah. Because at that point, Chikara's around at that point. They're just getting started as a wrestling school, but they're not running Philly really. They're running like Hellertown, they're running up more closer to like um like the not quite the lehigh valley but like they're running hellertown they're running they ran some school county shows yeah they were uh, they were in like uh like pottsville and and like port clinton yeah port carbon and places like yeah they're running they're running more toward um yeah like more up this way more in northeast pennsylvania or very far east pennsylvania they're not running philly they would run yeah. philly later they would do a lot of shows at the arena later they do king of trios there but that was when czw kind of is down on a little bit of a downswing 3pw didn't last very long ring of honor at that point they're mainly ring of honor at that point is mainly just running tv in philly they would film their tv there when they were on hd net um and then but Ring of Honor kind of shifted their big shows to uh, New York. They would run because uh, I was living up there at the time. Uh, they were running the uh, they would run North Jersey and Edison uh, Inman Sports Center. They would run uh, the Manhattan Center, which was where they used to tape Monday Night Raw. They would run the Hammerstein Ballroom for really big shows. So Ring of Honor became more of a touring company, less of a Philly specific company. Yeah. Um, so that's when Chikara slides in. Chikara slides in, in kind of like the 2006 2007 time, um, like the mid 2000s, and really kind of fills the void of czw come kind of entering a lull period 3pw not really lasting very long and ring of honor becoming more of a touring company yeah. um so well, that, that's the, the void that chikara fills the shift gears back to ecw there are they the ones who you say put hammerstein on the map uh for a wrestling venue yes yeah uh, i mean it's a it's a it's a legendary concert venue like mm-hmm. i know one time um ring of honor uh, i went to a ring of honor show at the manhattan center and uh as you leave the manhattan center uh is a is a huge uh, it's a huge complex in in new york city 
And when you say the Manhattan Center, like you think about Raw, you're really talking about a building called the Grand Ballroom, which is at the top of the Manhattan Center. And the Hammerstein Ballroom is on the other side. And I think one time while Ring of Honor was in the Grand Ballroom upstairs, there was like a disturbed concert going on in the Hammerstein. I remember one time I went to a Ring of Honor show at the Hammerstein Ballroom. And there's all the security. This is like 2008, 2009. So we're on there. There's all the security. Like I had, it was rainy. I had, you had to check your umbrella. You had to, if you had a coat, you couldn't have your coat on. You had to leave it at, at, at in the front. There was like pat downs and stuff. Like what the hell's going on here? It turns out that as there's wrestling going on and the Hammerstein up in the smaller grand ballroom upstairs, Madonna is doing dress rehearsals of her upcoming concert tour. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, ECW was the first one to do. Like they would do a lot of pay per views at the Hammer Side, and then the one night stands were, were very famous. But the first pay per view, kind of, kind of looping it back, uh, there, for, um, there were some controversial incidents. The mass transit thing, the, they had a fire chair incident where a fan got burned at a show, um, and then the Sandman got crucified at the same show. And Kurt Angle was supposed to sign with ECW, and he walked out and said never. Um, <laughs> it's like not a chance, and. So finally, they get their pay per view in 1997, and again, uh, and, and Paulie and Vince or ECW and and WWE are kind of a little tight knit at this point. They would bring people in, like uh, Brockus was a guy that WWF was trying to um, at the time. WWF was trying to really build up. He came to ECW for a little bit. Um, Draws Darren Drozdov, I believe, was there for a little bit. Al Snow kind of reinvented himself. He was signed by WWE, but they sent him to ECW, and that's where the head gimmick started. He started doing mm-hmm. that in ECW before it was ever in the when, WWF. Real, real quick, when did you become aware of ECW? Or early. how? It was early on. So in 1993, um, I, I briefly lived in the state of Delaware. And in 1993, I moved back to Pennsylvania from Delaware, and I lived in Delaware County, which is right outside of Philly. That's where I'm from. And there was a channel called Sports Channel Philadelphia, and they would show like Phillies games, Flyers games, Sixers games. It was the forerunner to right now Comcast Sportsnet Philly, Philadelphia, mm-hmm. or NBC Sports Philadelphia. Uh, before that existed, there was a channel called Sports Channel Philadelphia. And just flipping through channels, uh, I, I had a I had a very, very, I was very, very good at finding wrestling. I would just flip through channels. Oh, wrestling, I'm in. Um, and in 1993, flipping through channels, there's wrestling and I see like road warrior Hawk is there and, and Eddie Gilbert's there. And I know Eddie Gilbert because uh, the year before that Eddie Gilbert was in a company called the global wrestling federation, or maybe it was even 1991, mm-hmm. which was out of Texas. And they were on ESPN. Actually they're on ESPN too. And, and, and Eddie Gilbert was one of their big stars for like the, the first couple of months before they all ran out of money. Um, and so Eddie Gilbert's there and, and then you see this crazy guy, Sabu and, so I, I, I ECW uh, is on my radar in 1993, um, which is ve- pr- fairly early on in their in their in their existence because there was a company before that called the Tri-State Wrestling Association, maybe Alliance TWA. I was known as TWA, um, and they would run they would run shows, pretty big indie shows in Philly. They would they would draw some big crowds, but again, they ran out of money, mm-hmm. and Todd Gordon. Uh, kind of came on as a an investor in in Tri State Wrestling, and the guy who ran it, Joel Goodhart, just kind of it went belly up. He he had a radio show on the on the sports radio station in Philly, and like this the week before a show, he said, "Yep, show's canceled," and um, it was supposed to be Buddy Rogers and Buddy Landell in the Battle of the Nature Boys, and it never happened. But he kind of also skipped town with the presale tickets, and that is why to this day, if you're in Pennsylvania, you have to post that ten thousand dollar bond for um for uh promoting a wrestling event it's mm-hmm. it's it's a joel goodhart rule so yeah. by so not- for, for real yeah. quick for me um this I, I had a friend we talked wrestling and he was older than me our moms worked together and he was always like bro you gotta watch like your love wrestling and all he goes why don't you watch this and this and this and i go bro so i was like rudy's dad i was like in this house there's only one football team that plays and that's the wwe like i was like the rudy guy you know what i mean like I didn't watch anything else. The only time I really ever consumed WCW at all was because of the N64 video games. WCW okay. versus WCW Nitro and World Tour. It's the only reason I consumed WCW is because those games were so good. But I didn't know who I was playing as. I was just like, this game is fantastic. It's a really mm-hmm. fun wrestling game to play with your friends. And that was the only exposure I had to WCW. Um, I didn't watch it. 
So See, I, I was if, if if I found wrestling, I'm watching the wrestling. It, yeah. I don't care if it's ECW, WCW, WWF, Glow, Global. It yeah, it doesn't matter. I, I was wrestling very I'm brand specific. I'm glad I'm glad I have grown out of that, and I I wish more wrestling fans wouldn't be that way because I'm watching people now who are like I only watch WWE. I'm like you're missing out. Man. Yeah. This this point in time in wrestling, you are if you're only watching one and you say you love this business, you are doing a huge disservice to yourself. But I uh, I this kid was like yo. E, there's this thing called ECW is extreme and it's real. And I was like, what oh, do you, you would always say that. Real? Yeah. And like, it's real, bro. Like they're, they're doing this, this, and this it's 100%. It's not like WWE. It's real. And I was like, and I'm young. And I was like, I, all right, this kid's a, he's a Mark, you know I'm like? What yeah. an idiot. And I remember turning it on. And the first thing I see is like a Dudley boys, falls count anywhere match. And Bubba is holding somebody by their hair and he's just taking a cheese grater across his yep. forehead. And there's just blood pour. I was like, I think this is real. <laughs> it allowed you to suspend that disbelief for a little it bit. Did, of it did. Younger. It got me. It got and, me. And, yeah. and there, there were always urban legends like, oh, if you go to an ECW show, you have to sign a release. You have yeah. to. Yeah. You I, have all to, that was fed know, to me. Yeah. Like there were those, always those, like, uh, always those, like, uh, tall tales about it. And they, they and and like they would they had a great propensity for getting people to actually believe their angles too yeah uh, and i and two of them in particular uh the angle with the sandman being blinded uh that they did that so well and and the sandman did a great job of it too where they did a ma they had a match with uh dreamer and sandman where sandman has a cigarette and dreamer like goes to push him in the face and the cigarette goes in sandman's eye and they treat it like it's legit uh they treat it like it's legit like sandman's retiring and he walked around like everywhere with like bandages over his face for like a month to sell it. And then in the, uh, in the retirement ceremony, when dreamer turns his back, he rips the bandages off and just busts them over the head with a cane. Yeah. Uh, and, and the other thing I think uh, some people actually kind of believe, maybe not a lot of people, but they, 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 they did it the exact right way where when they brought in Bill Alfonso to kind of tone things down a little bit, as they brought in Bill Alfonso saying, that he, ECW has gotten too out of control and Bill Alfonso has been appointed by the state athletic commission and he has in, to, to, to uh, cool down ECW. And I think people really bought it. I think people thought like it never let that athletic in commission it. into your, into your shows. Yeah. yeah. Um, if you do let them in, you break their jaw. Too soon. <laughs> too soon. <laughs> too soon. Uh, but, but ECW by 1997 is is trying to get pay per view. They finally get it. Uh, by 1997, they're they're finally gonna have barely legal, which is their first pay per view from the ECW arena. And WWF is on the ropes. They're getting their ass beat by WCW in the Monday Night War. They're in trouble. The NWO is in full swing. Uh, WWF is looking for something, anything. Heyman is helping consult consult consultancy wise. And he even they had a show called Live Wire, and he calls in as Bruce from Connecticut. <laughs> and he's like just yelling at people there uh he's yelling at um at, at uh, vince russo i think it was vic venom at the time um and by 1997 they do a thing where ecw is going to invade raw raw's at the manhattan center so ecw shows up jerry lawler was doing a back and forth feud with um with ecw he would show up at the arena uh, he actually um him and Cornette showed up one time because Cornette and Heyman really didn't like each other at this point Going back to the NWA thing where Shane Douglas threw down the NWA world title, the guy they really screwed was Dennis Corluzzo, who was the NWA promoter out of New Jersey. And Jim Cornette was very friendly with Corluzzo. And there was bad mm -hmm. blood between Cornette and Heyman forever. But Lawler and Cornette show up one time. And I remember, I think it was Lawler hit Tommy Dreamer with the Sandman's cane and caught him and ruptured his testicle. Uh, so very painful injury there. Uh, but they do they do a thing on Raw where the BWO shows up. Uh, Rob Van Dam starts showing up as Mr. Monday Night. Uh, there was a little bit of working back and forth uh, and like an ECW versus WWF feud, feud throughout 1997. But what's happening is when WWF really starts to come up in 1998 and Austin's taken off and The Rock's taken off and and wrestling as, and a, as a whole is taking off because by 98, like WCW is still going pretty strong. Like they're starting to lose steam a little bit. But 98, both both companies are really, really going strong and the, and the war is in full swing and what that did and this is great for the boys is it rose there were bidding wars for people and if you couldn't steal somebody from wwf or wcw oh well, let's get a guy from ecw so ecw had to start paying their talent more to keep them around and it just wound up becoming that bubble got so big that paul Heyman couldn't fund it anymore and they weren't making mm -hmm. enough money to fund it and that's why ecw gets into financial trouble they say by the time that they were um 
at the end of their rope in like 2001. They get they get a show on TNN for a little bit, but TNN was just kind of using them as a test case because they really wanted to get WWF. And in 2001, they do make the deal to set, to get their 2000 or 2001. I believe 2000 is when um, Raw went from USA to TNN. And then later it was Spike TV. And uh, they also got kind of screwed out of some video game royalties. They had a video game, two video games, actually. Uh, Hardcore Revolution and Anarchy Rules. And the publisher of the video games was Acclaim. And Acclaim went out of business. So they, they were supposed to get royalties on those video games that they never got because Acclaim went belly up. Um, you don't you didn't get the pay-per-view money right away. So by the time they were... By the time ECW closes down in 2001, they have $7 million in debt, but they were owed $3 million in pay-per-view money. But still, they were still $4 million in the hole. Mm -hmm. And Heyman had kind of checked out at that point. Uh, the other thing that happens in 2001, I know we're going long. I'm going to try to assure no, you a good. little bit. Um, in 2001, Jerry Lawler is and Jim Ross are the, the voices of WWF. And Jerry Lawler is dating Stacey Carter at the time, who was the cat um in in wwf and she got fired she got fired in february of 2001 and basically jerry lawler stood up for her and said hey look if she goes i'm gone too and they're like okay jerry you know, sorry to hear that but you're done um and so when jerry lawler leaves paul Heyman joins jim ross in the commentary booth and it's the first time he's done commentary regularly since the early 90s in wcw and Heyman has that going on. He also was in a movie at that time. They did a remake of the movie Rollerball, and he was the announcer for Rollerball. So he's he's in um, he's in California trying to get work as an actor and doing he's at, at Raw every Monday while ECW is just dying. Like Tommy Dreamer was the one that was really kind of taking over ECW at that point and running the day to day. And Tommy Dreamer is trying to put funding together to, to buy it like. Uh, I think he had set up something with like I think a company's called like Rainbow Sports or something like that, and they were they were going to put together a deal to buy ECW, but Heyman was like, "No, we're we're done, we're done," and that's why Dreamer was like so distraught. They say, and Dreamer himself has admitted this that he says, and I don't know if he really meant it or not, but this is what he claims. He says that there was a point where he was going to go to WrestleMania X Seven, WrestleMania Seventeen, where Paul Heyman was announcing with Jim Ross. He said he was going to hop the rail with a gun. And he was going to shoot Paul Heyman in the head and then shoot himself in the head. Like, that's how distraught he was at ECW going away. Um, I mean, when you think of, like, angles in ECW, right? There's always the extreme violent angles. There's always their extreme violent moments. But, like, going back and rewatching it, because I remember a lot of people speaking so highly of it. Like, when you have those dusty moments and you have those, like come up moments or that moment where like you had your Mikey Whipwreck, which was another big one, but like yeah. the Tommy dreamer taking the Singapore cane and just kept taking it yeah. and taking it to the point where the crowds, like, like the crowds begging you to stop. Like Tommy was like what I yeah. thought ECW, I immediately, he was the heart put Tommy, soul, yeah. I put Tommy dreamer as the guy of ECW and, and more so than even that dreamer and Raven dreamer and Raven was who's and, and I know we were talking about like the things before and, and I don't know if I, I don't think I would do Dudley boys and uh and this I would do Raven's flock against uh the the special well, because I seen Raven in ECW made me interested when Raven's flock went to WCW mm -hmm. like I was like I like this guy like I was into Raven because of ECW yeah, so when ECW goes away, Paul Heyman goes to WWF first as an announcer, and then the announcing thing kind of ends when Lawler comes back. So when Lawler's gone, that's when WWF buys WCW. They're doing the invasion, and WWF was one of the creditors for ECW. ECW owed WWF a lot of money. I, I don't know if they took out loans or what the deal was, but they WWF WWF was one of the people who, um, when ECW went bankrupt, were you know one of the people they owed money to. And so they bring in ECW as part of the uh, invasion where they're saying like Shane McMahon owns WCW, but Stephanie McMahon bought ECW. And now they're the Alliance and they're going to take out WWF and take out Vince. And so Heyman is now the heel announcer uh, with Jim Ross. And 
he's the voice of the alliance. He's the voice of WCW and ECW. On, on it was on wild at one point to see Vince, Eric Bischoff, and Paul Heyman on the screen at one time. Yeah, like, I, well, on Bischoff Monday isn't Night there Raw. yet. Bischoff but I'm saying, isn't like, there later yet. on, it was like, yeah. are you, this is cr- this is on TV right now. Mm-hmm. Like, it's bonkers. That's bonkers. Yep. And then uh, when the invasion ends in in uh, in November of 2001, uh, Paul Heyman is fired. Like all the WCW and ECW people are fired in storyline. And then Jerry Lawler is coming back at that point because uh, after he quit his job over Stacey Carter, about three or four months later, Stacey Carter dumped him. So <laughs> so that happened. That and so, so uh, ha- hat in hand. Um, actually, one of the things he did while he was not in there, like because WCW closed down, Jimmy Hart and Hulk Hogan and, and Brian Knobs put together a taping service thing called the XWF. And you can find these on YouTube. And they did. They just basically shot a few episodes as a pilot, but nobody ever picked it up. And the commentary team, and this is a unique team, the commentary team for the XWF is Tony Schiavone and Jerry the King Lawler. It's a very unique team. Because Lawler crazy. didn't do a whole lot of commentary outside of, of WWF yeah. or WWE. So Heyman short. I he, loved him as a kid, and as I get older and rewatch old pay per views, I can't stand him. On it didn't page. age well just because of the risque content and the kind of yeah. sexism of it. It was boring. And, it was kind of it's kind of boring to listen to as an adult. It's like it's like cheap comedy. It's like yeah. Or like listen, I'm listen, I'm not above it. I'll laugh at a fart joke, but like it, it just it's like no. going back and listen to old Jerry. It's like shut compared up. to like a Bobby Heenan or a Jesse Ventura in their primes. It's it, yes. it, it, it's it's there's no contest. They're timeless. Like I can listen to them yeah. all day. And so hey, Heyman, I think, is also helping out creatively backstage at this point. And in 2002, he's been Heyman has been off TV since uh, November 2001. And in April of 2002, after WrestleMania 18, uh, the big guy debuting for the WWF the night after WrestleMania in 2002. You may have heard of this guy afterward. He's a guy named Brock Lesnar. Um, and so... Brock Lesnar's debut is one of the best debuts ever. There's just this match with like Spike Dudley and a few other people. Brock Lesnar just comes in with Paul Heyman and kills everybody. Like I, I think Spike or somebody comes off the top rope with a pool cue and breaks over Brock's head. Brock just like kind of cracks his neck and just clotheslines the guy's head. He off. does that. He did that move. Yeah. Or it was actually a t- it was in the video game where he would like, yeah, how he would just slay. You and, and it came from that moment. Yeah. So that is the beginning of a very important relationship, which was Paul Heyman and Brock Lesnar. They they were p- put together. Heyman was like a mentor for Brock in pro wrestling, and they became friends. They they became mm-hmm. genuine friends. So so Heyman's being used as a manager, and this is also the time that they're splitting the rosters. Heyman is managing Brock Lesnar, but at the same time, obviously Vince McMahon has the final creative direction over everything. But on on the grand scheme of things, Paul Heyman becomes a head writer for SmackDown. And I believe at that point, Brian Gewirtz was the head writer for Raw. And so that's that seems it seems like a golden age of SmackDown because you had what was called the SmackDown Six, where they uh, Heyman really pushed out of these six guys and you just had them have great matches with each other for a year. It was a uh, Edge, uh, Christian, Kurt Angle, or no, I'm sorry, Edge, Ray Mysterio, Kurt Angle, um, Edge, Ray Mysterio, Kurt Angle, uh, Chris Benoit, unfortunately, um, Eddie Guerrero and Chavo Guerrero Jr. And they they just had incredible matches throughout 2002, and and Brock wound up going over there. But eventually, um, there's a lot as Stephanie McMahon gets more and more involved in commentary or in um, commentary in uh, creative On screen. Yeah, she would or no behind the scenes. Like she yeah. she became the head of creative, and she loved Brian Gewirtz. Like what, apparently, ex writers say, well, like, why can't you just write it like Brian would write it? And now, of course, Brian Gewirtz is very in, in tight with The Rock. Um, mm-hmm. He works with him, so. Heyman and Stephanie butt heads frequently and Paul Heyman winds up like they just have blow ups and eventually and, and, hey- and Heyman was like the on screen general manager of Smackdown for a little bit managed the big show for a little bit because at this point in 2004 2005 Brock is gone and and Heyman's not really managing anybody so to kind of get him away from Stephanie because they're at each other's throats he was a uh, he became the booker of uh, OVW because Jim Cornette this is around the time that Jim Cornette was pushed out because he hit a guy <laughs> literally he started hitting santino morella uh who would have killed him yeah because yeah. santino was like a legit shooter yeah. um but Heyman takes over for Cornette and ovw that's where he meets cm punk that's where he becomes friendly with cm punk and at this time they're also doing ecw one night stand which was rob van dam's idea just a one night ecw pay-per-view it it did really well um and i believe the other thing that really made them want to do that ecw one night stand was they did a DVD called The Rise and Fall of ECW, which sold amazingly well. 
amazingly well, which I sh we should have mentioned somewhere along this point. Um, basically, WWE made a deal to buy the the rights to ECW from the people who, uh, the creditors, like the, the people who ECW owed money to, which was, they were one of them. So ECW, One Night Stand is a huge success. And they, so in 2006, they do it again. And then they they bring back ECW as a third brand a new third brand like kind of like not quite developmental but not quite not not developmental and that was um that was that was a um a thing that happened and paulie was involved a, a bit creatively not entirely uh his creative power over ecw dwindled very quickly and to the point where at the end of 2006 uh when they did that december to dismember show where Bobby Lashley uh, beats the big show for the, um, the ECW title. Heyman's kind of done and Heyman's out and Heyman is not just out of ECW. He is out of wrestling. He's out of wrestling for six years. He's, he's out for a long time. He, he winds up doing the, uh, he, he ran, I think he still runs a marketing agency or co-runs a marketing agency in New York called looking for Larry. But the other, the, the one kind of thread Sam that maybe um <laughs> but but the one kind of thread he still has with with professional wrestling is his friendship with Brock Lesnar but Brock Lesnar is also long gone from pro wrestling at this point Brock Lesnar uh left wrestling at the first point in i believe 2004 after WrestleMania 20 or, um or that was his NFL stint right uh yeah yeah it was 2004 yeah 2004 at the WrestleMania 20 he leaves to go to the Minnesota Vikings and that doesn't work uh he had a few matches in Japan where like they tried they they basically had like a seven year non compete in wrestling and they're like that's ridiculous but he didn't do a lot of wrestling but he did do MMA and obviously he goes to UFC and um he is still very tight with Paul Heyman Paul Heyman I, I believe helped write his book uh Paul Heyman was still very involved in his um like a lot of the business stuff with Brock they were always very closely knit together and that is how he comes back uh Heyman comes back when Brock comes back in 2012 as uh as as brock lesnar's legal advisor and he's been with wwe kind of ever since uh, you know it's a huge missed opportunity like you think about the streak right like the streak ending and mm -hmm. people are still upset about it but i think it was the right call with brock lesnar i personally do but could you imagine in a perfect world you have taker and paul bear in one corner and brock and paul in the other yeah that would have been interesting oh. yeah that would have been interesting but unfortunately at that point uh paul barrett already passed. yeah like it, it just when you think of managers man like paul i don't know well i'm sure we'll put a button in that towards the end of just like where yeah he, where, where he stands as the all-time greats yeah um but yeah that's i mean we, i think we all know what's happened since then he had that really really great run with lesnar he had a great run with cm punk when lesnar was kind of just there sparingly in 2013 uh, they they tried with some other guys. Remember, he managed Curtis Axel for a minute. He managed Cesaro for a minute. Ryback, Big Show. Ryback, yeah, I, Big Show was a little earlier than that, but but then they really found the the niche with Lesnar when Lesnar was coming in more regularly. Um, and he had that wonderful run with Lesnar, which takes us right into the bloodline, which takes us right to now, uh, going mm -hmm. to the Hall of Fame. Uh, definitely recognized by everybody as one of the all time greats as a manager. Um, I'll and, tell you what. I want to give Roman his flowers here. His introduction to Paul was great. I thought mm -hmm. he like him coming up to me like, what do I say for a guy that is the best talker in the world? Like, yeah. how did I draw this draw? Like, I thought Roman was really charismatic in that intro to Paul. The speech was unbelievable. It was yep. everything you wanted from Paul Heyman um, for his kids, for his business, like kind of throw, showing the three faces that we joked around at the thumbnail, yeah. the three faces of Paul Heyman. Um, like it was beautiful it was it was it was everything you needed and i mean the guy we're, we're not talking about him as if he's gone because he's still at the top no, of his game yeah, like he's, he's still, like there's he, no slowing this guy down nick like, like and, and 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 obviously roman is the engine because it's roman and, and he's the guy that's actually he turned uh, roman baby face without even roman being on screen yeah and 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 but Paul what, Heyman what? has always <laughs> been able to not only keep things interesting through his microphone work but keep things interesting through his um usually anything he's doing on screen he's having some creative involvement with too 
Uh, he, he's he, like Brock and Roman have kind of been able to write their own tickets with a lot of creative and to the point now where it's coming out that um, it looks like the reason that Cody didn't finish the story in, 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 in L.A. at WrestleMania 39 is because Roman and Roman and Heyman pushed for Roman to win that one and, and have Cody win at 40. Mm-hmm. And yeah, yeah uh, that, because the and the rock like, picked up the phone. Yeah, well, th- th- there's been a lot of stuff about that, too, where yeah. um I guess there was a, a point sometime where somebody said like Rock was going to beat Roman and then vacate the title but be the People's Champion. It's like okay, I don't know if that's a great idea. Dude, um, but I, but I, I, I'm terrified of the Rock. I'm going to be honest, man. man I'm getting, I'm getting Hogan okay. vibes. I'm Dude. getting terrified. He, he doesn't want to wrestle enough to be Hogan. Um, I I will die on the hill that I think Cody won a 39 was the right move, but I feel okay about it because if Cody would have won a 39, I wouldn't have been able to be there for him winning at 40 yeah uh, so. and the only dude honestly the only thing and we didn't talk about this the only thing of that wrestlemania for like that that ending that i did not like at all and everyone was saying it's supposed to be austin it was supposed to be this it was supposed to be that i don't think you need stone cold in that i don't and i definitely did not like the undertaker spot like I, the, I, the nostalgia kick doesn't do it for me like visually i feel all the people who were treated by the Ro- by Roman and the bloodline for two years should have been the ones to run off the bloodline to let them be like, no, we're standing up for Cody. This guy's going to have his moment. He's going to Roman's going to have to stand in his own and have the roster that you're currently pushing and working with every single week be the deciding factor to push away the bloodline. So that ma- that moment happens. I think the Undertaker was a giant cop out just to get a nostalgia hit. I, I I I see where you're coming from. I, I think I do disagree. Uh, and I, I it would have been definitely better with Steve Austin. And just because that is the Rock's foil. That is the Rock's... That is the Joker. The, the Rock is the Joker to Austin's Batman. Mm-hmm. And I, I guess Austin, the, the, it came out later. They couldn't come to a deal. I, I would have thrown him whatever money you needed for that. Yeah. But the I think it would also would have been that we have John Cena and Steve Austin... The last two flag bearer baby faces of WWE saying, Cody, it's yours now. And, mm-hmm. and and that is something that that is something that across generations, across eras of WWE would have been a really good kind of button on that, just because it's not so much it's not even about like finishing the story as far as Roman's title reign. It's like, no, Cody is the man now. Cody is Cody is the next in that line of uh, it, it, and I've had this discussion with people too of like there's a difference between being the champion in WWE and being the guy and sometimes mm-hmm. there isn't a guy sometimes you just don't have one but you can follow that lineage of this is the, the or the flag bearer this is the cornerstone that you're building the company around and I think it, it very clearly goes from Bruno to Hogan you didn't have one for a while like Brett tried Sean tried Diesel tried but he didn't really have one for a while because from Hogan the next guy that's like that is Austin and then you didn't Taker, have one. For, I mean, Taker nope. was there, but he he was not. I wouldn't consider nope. him the guy either. Nope. He tried. There, there's been there's been five of them, uh, or six of them. I have to count it out. Bruno, Hogan, Austin, Cena, Roman, and possibly now Cody. Time will tell. You don't put the Rock in there with nope. with wasn't around the, long enough. Austin barely was around long enough. But yeah. but but Rock became a bigger star outside of wrestling. Within the WWE scope, it was Austin. Yeah. Austin is the guy that, that that shot the rocket off. The rock kept it going. The rock, the and it and it it got the rock out there a little more, but it was Austin. Like the attitude yeah, there, it was Austin. Totally agree. Yeah, I don't I don't hate that at all. All right, so let's let's do this. Paul Heyman, we always say our Mount Rushmores, right? Mm-hmm. Is he? I mean, this is a this is a stupid question. Is he on the Mount Rushmores of, of managers? His, of of managers, yeah. Yes. Yeah, he definitely the tough spot on Mount Rushmore is number four because you make an argument for a lot of guys. Um, is, but, is Paul one or two? Paul might be three. Paul's either two really? or three. Paul three. Paul's either two or three for me. One is set in stone. One is Bobby Heenan. Yes. One is Bobby Heenan. No discussion. Uh two and three. I, I go back and forth, and I know you're gonna cringe at this. I don't hate he's, it. He's so good. Um two and three, it, it fluctuates between Jim Cornette and Paul Heyman. You can give Paul Heyman points for longevity, but if Paul Heyman rolls over Jim Cornette, it's because he stood on his shoulders. A lot of Paul Heyman's early early managerial work has been beca- was very inspired by Jim Cornette. Um, and here's here's where I'll put Paul over over Jim. I I feel like when you're in the business, 
and when you're a, 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 a factor of the business of someone who's been around and has been and, and done things and has helped pave the way and then you're no longer in the on the on the major brand and then how you conduct yourself or how you speak about the business and how, what you contribute to the business after you're gone i think paul has done more positive in the business Oh, Heyman has said some very controversial stuff. I, I know, if, but I'm if, saying if like... If Heyman had a podcast, Paul, you'd probably be saying a lot of stuff Cornette's saying. But I'm saying, yeah, maybe, but I think like, it's kind of like um, Sean and Brett. Like, Sean mm -hmm. is in NXT working. He's, he's, and Brett's still upset about getting kicked by Goldberg. You know what I mean? Like, it's, I, I respect... I, I think that's I, a gross oversimplification. But but Brett is more, mostly time when Brett's speaking about wrestling, he's very bitter and angry. But, and, but that okay, who's a better that that's a different question. Who's a better ex wrestler, Sean or Brett? That that's a different question. Who who did a better job of leading by example as a wrestler? Brett by far, by far, by far. I I think they were both little little cunts at some point in time. <laughs> like yeah, I think they were but, both in the, they were both equally guilty of what the Brett, what they didn't Brett like about the other one. Brett Brett wasn't putting feces in anybody's salads or or, or sandwiches that we know of. That's true. <laughs> because That's Owen true. was. <laughs> no, Owen was doing funnier stuff than that. that yeah, yeah. That no, Owen was doing funnier stuff. Owen yeah, was doing yeah. much funnier stuff. But I respect but, both of them. I respect the hell out of Bret Hart. I, but I'm I will always be a Sean guy. <laughs> but I, I I I get very back and forth between who my number two is because he nobody's touching Heenan. Heenan yeah. Heenan is in a class by himself, and then it's up. Uh, Louis dangerously, unfortunately, does not make the Mount Rushmore. Yeah, uh, maybe not. the route. I don't even know if he makes the Mount Rushmore of ECW managers. The yeah. Mount Rushmore of ECW managers probably uh, Francine, uh, yeah, Paulie dangerously, one. Bill Alfonso is probably number one, and uh, maybe Louis dangerously is fourth, but probably not. He's definitely better. I would than, like, go Francine so. over over as one. Fonzie's not Fonzie's the man. Fonzie's, Fonzie's two for man. me. I love Fonzie, but I would go Francine over Fonzie. Because I mean, Fran Francine, Francine got the worst of it. Like she was, I don't know how she's not in therapy. Like they, they were horrible Fran Fran to her. Francine's a tough girl from Philly. She can handle. Yeah, she's, she's, she's a bad. Right. She's a beast. So every I, I still have never said a word to her. I've been in three cons with her. I'm terrified. <laughs> like she intimidates the shit out of me. Francine's great. I, I've never met I know, her. No, but, but I'm just saying, great. like she's. I, I've beautiful. met her, but I've never seen Francine, with her. and she's beautiful, and every like you know what I mean. Like I just my respect for her is just like that's fucking Francine. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I, I, I just, I kind of, I actually, that's like at Tom's River. I walked by, I went hi, and I just walked away. I was gonna uh, buy an my, autograph, but I didn't have the, I didn't have the courage. <laughs> the one for, uh, the one interaction with Francina had was at a uh, Chiller Theater in, 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 um, in, um, Jersey, and went there, met Demolition there, met the Iron Sheik there, um, and I was there with my, my, um my best friend and his and his son was his oldest son was two years old at that point and son's with us and we're just walking around and we go around this corner and francine looks at his son and goes what a cute baby uh, and francine was actually pregnant at the time too i would have was... melted i would have <laughs> melted right into my shoes and uh yeah Fr francine was actually pregnant at the time so she had the uh the mommy uh the mommy uh jeans were very strong in her at that point yeah yeah that would have melted into my shoes. All right, so who's number four on the Mount Rushmore? Uh, that 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 is tougher. I I tend to land. I go back and forth on a few people. I tend to land on Jimmy Hart. I tend mm. to land on Jimmy Hart. Uh, but I'll you can make a case for Albano. You can Black, make a case for Grand Wizard. Blassie. You can make a class for Blast. You can make a class uh, a case for Sherry. Um, Sherry. Ooh, Sherry. Up there. Yeah, Sherry is up there for me. Uh, Sherry might. Uh, if I, I I usually land on Jimmy Hart because apparently like if you and I haven't seen a whole lot of it, but they say most people have never seen Jimmy Hart's best work. Like if you see Jimmy Hart with a honky tonk man or the Hart Foundation or Hulk Hogan or somebody like that, you Jimmy Hart was getting stabbed and shot at. Like he was yeah. that good at what he did back in the Jimmy day. Hart he was, he was taking Memphis, three bullets. Jimmy Hart in Memphis was uh, purportedly on another level. And I know he just did so many other things. Like he was doing a lot of music stuff with them. And uh, so Jimmy Hart is usually who I put as number four. Jimmy I don't, Hart, I don't uh, hate that either. And, and I mean, the guy bought you a soda, you know? Yeah. Yes, he yeah. did. <laughs> Paul, oh man, what a what an episode, man! The episode, the history of Paul Heyman, BP. Um, what do you want to do next week? Uh next. Well, what day are we doing this next week? Is the other question because uh, Sunday we will be. Sunday we will be at um, PPW. You want, to shoot again for, you want to shoot again for a Saturday? We do Saturday again. Yeah, I have nothing right. going on next. Uh, I may have some going on during the day next Saturday, but I should be back. Saturday, night, of yeah. time for uh, for Saturday night. 
Um, I want to save something for May. In May, um, at some point, I want to I want to do another event. I want to do Slamboree 1994 because it'll be May of 94. It'll be the 30th anniversary of the show. It were 30 okay. years ago. It was the first pay-per-view I was ever at, and it's a very fun show. Okay. That's so it. That, that uh, is coming up in the future. Let's open it to the chat. We'll give you guys a couple minutes here. Post some ideas that you guys want to do. I know we talked about one in the earlier that, that Ryan Vox was to join, so we could do that one. Not next, not but Stephanie possibly Gilbert. in the future, Eddie Gilbert. Uh, is there anything on your mind that you definitely really want to put out there and talk about? I'm not for the month the, of does the month of May spark anything up for oh, you? We, you know what? This is May. I'm an idiot. We're in May now. Let's yeah. do it. Let's do Slambury 94 next month. Right, so everybody fire up Peacock. We're gonna watch a show. Are you okay with this? Or yeah, yeah. You gotta get Francine in the pot. I would love to. I, I don't she, she I, probably I would... has some amazing stories. Francine yeah. is uh, I, I'm a, a, I'm and... a Francine Mark. Tagger, tagger in this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we we have we have nothing but good things to say about Francine. Francine's mothers in wrestling. For Mother's Day, there you go. Yeah, that that'll work. Yeah, that let's do that. Be one. Kind of fun. We'll do that one. And we'll do Slambury the week after. All right. Top mothers in wrestling. Yeah. And why is it Judy Bagwell? <laughs> yeah, well, I think we've <laughs> I, have we we've done this before. I think we did do. Mothers. We did do that. I think I think we've done. I think we did it last year. As a matter of fact, was it on this platform though? Was it the yes? Old one? I believe so because I remember us talking a lot about Judy Bagwell. <laughs> or, yeah I, I remember talking a lot about judy bagwell because uh shortly after that i met buff bagwell oh you met him oh yeah that's right you were at a show with him he was uh he was a sweetheart too um sweetheart of a let guy me, let me uh i think it was i want to say it was this platform i think it was post the podcast and it was more of this live stream let's see i'm gonna i'm because uh, i know for a while we had some episodes that weren't numbered and they weren't podcasts related. I want to say if it wasn't last year, it was the year before, but I, I'm pretty sure we did Mothers in Wrestling because I know we covered Judy Bagwell like pretty hardcore. <laughs> it does. I'm going to be honest. It's, it is kind of ringing a bell for me as well. Uh, let's see here. All right, that's muted. It's not going to. It may have even been when Buff Bagwell's Dark Side of the Ring came out or, or something like that. Um. I don't see it. So I don't think it was on this platform. Did we, did we cover Buff Bagwell at all? We or? didn't. We did not. Huh. All right. We might have just it. had it. So, like, just to kind of go through, we started with uh, Smash Master Preview, The Death of Nancy, Alicia Atut Interview, History of Sting Part One, Chikara Review, uh, the trivia, the indie wrestling draft, which was a lot of fun. That was a uh, lot of fun. The pro wrestling. We should actually. I know it's post draft. Do you want to do another? Do you want another draft another company with today's we indie could do talent? That. talent? We could do that. Yeah. I think that'd be a fun one. Uh, Naughty or Lice Pro Wrestling List, End of the Year Awards, uh, Pro Wrestling Predictions, uh, Recap Show, Jerry Jarrett, uh, No Mercy, WrestleMania 22, WrestleMania 5, 28, 29, 80s and 90s Tag Teams, Championship Drafts. Yeah, I don't see it on here. All right, let's do it. We're in. I'm in. All right. So we'll do uh so we can do mothers we'll do rather we'll do mothers wrestling, um we'll do slamboree and then we'll do another independent wrestling draft. Yeah, uh, I'm all for that. Although uh, I, I have to be very careful that indie wrestling. Oh yeah, draft. we still have to do the U.S. title history as well. Yeah, we'll do that, that for Fourth of July cool. weekend. That that sounds like a perfect Fourth time of July. That. We'll do the U.S. title. Maybe by then I can earn up a couple bucks, and uh, I can talk to some belt makers and maybe we can find a way to get a part. custom. U.S. title made I, as as a giveaway it, or something. If I were to get a replica belt, I'm too cheap to ever do it. I, I've had this discussion with people, but uh, my first one I would get would be the uh, the old school Intercontinental title. The second one might be the WCW US title. That's one of my favorite belts. There you go. MA likes draft too. So I might have a custom Intercontinental Championship coming. A custom oh, podcast Intercontinental Championship coming. Sweet. We'll see how it goes. But man, thank you guys so much. For having us uh we appreciate you guys for for tuning in and, and really supporting the channel i know we've been away for a while so uh, you know we, we we will get active on that wrestlemania was tough and we're doing a lot of stuff outside of oh, this my my brain was fried for like two weeks after mania oh, i was shot i was shot i was shot my brain was fried 
but thank you guys so much. We are still doing watch alongs. So if you want to come in and hang out with me on some watch alongs, they're always there. Uh, we have a lot of great content on the Ben Frank connection as well as uh, just the, the channel itself. Uh, five questions with ABJ, a whole bunch more drop. And I just did an interview with Paul London that you guys should definitely go check out. Um, like I said before, um, our, our YouTube membership, super chats and donations are turned off right now. Um, full disclosure, I'm not working. I have no income. I was really banking on that last YouTube check to kind of help me out a little bit. And now it's on a pending hold and I have to wait 30 days to try to try to open it up so I can claim the money that was there. So merchandise sales would really help or anything you guys can do. Patreon is always there. If you can't monetarily, I get it. Hit the thumbs up button, hit subscribe, share this to your friends. Uh, make sure you go subscribe over to opinion city podcast, Raz's channel, uh, witchcraft by Lily high tension wrestling, all those channels and really show them the support. Uh, that'll do it for us. Uh, anything else you want to plug before we get out of here, BP? No, I already plugged out. Uh, I'll, I'll do it again. PPW thunder road. Um, I believe I don't know if they're doing this again this time, but the last couple of shows, if you're not in Pennsylvania, you're not local. If you go to premier wrestling's YouTube channel, the last like two or three or four PPW shows have been streamed live on there. But mm -hmm. if you can make it, come on out to Slatington, Pennsylvania. It's going to be a fun time. You'll be done by like six o'clock at night. If you're doing something for mother's day, you can go hang out afterward. Uh, if you don't not doing something for mother's day, I don't know if Funk Brewing is going to be open afterward, but if they are, I'll be at the show. Bring your moms. I'll give her a kiss. Uh, I believe we are going to have a uh, mom's only Philadelphia Playboy kissing booth at the. Uh, at the oh, show. Not, you I just stole my bit. Booth. I was going to do a. I was going to do a kissing booth for the moms, but never mind. It's been Maybe get a two for one special going. Two for one, yeah, you can get yeah. it. I'll have I'll have the ABJ stand, and he can do the kissing booth. There you go. There you go. Nothing. Nothing nefarious going on there. See you guys next yeah. week. We're out of here. Bye. <laughs>